Hello everyone. Welcome to the first video in this series exploring the Kalkenwolf tree. Today, we'll introduce the main ideas, which will develop throughout the series. Let's get started. Here's the motivating question. Can you make a list of the rationals where each number appears exactly once? The rational numbers are countable, so this must be possible, but the approach is important. While we attempt to make such a list, we should prioritize simplicity so that the list is easy to describe and generate. Let's give this a try. We might start with 1 over 1, then 1 over 2, 1 over 3, and so on. This is a good start, at least there will be no repeats. But if we continue like this, we would use up the entire list and never see fractions like 2 fifths, for example. We could create more lists like this, and then interleave them together, but as the number of lists grows, it gets harder to avoid repeats, and it is likely that we'll forget to include many fractions by mistake. Clearly, we would benefit from a more structured approach. The traditional method is to create a table. In each entry, we write the fraction whose column number and row number are the numerator and denominator. Doing this for every entry produces a grid which contains all possible fractions, so we are sure not to miss any. We can rotate the table 45 degrees, then read the fractions one row at a time to produce a list with every rational number. However, there are repeats. For example, 2 over 2 already appears reduced as 1 over 1. We could just remove it from the list, along with all other fractions that aren't reduced. This idea is nice in theory, but in general, we cannot determine a priori if a given fraction is reduced. We would have to run an algorithm on each fraction to decide whether or not to keep it. But we wanted simplicity, so what's the clever idea? Start with a fraction, p over q, where p and q are positive integers. There are two simple operations we can perform on this fraction to make new fractions. We could add the numerator to the denominator, or we could add the denominator to the numerator. These operations are important, and we'll call them the left rule and the right rule. Let's see what happens when we perform these operations on the fraction 1 over 1. From the left rule, we get 1 over 1 plus 1, which is 1 half, and from the right rule, we get 2 over 1. We can apply the rules again to make more fractions, and so on. This structure is called the Kalkin-Wolf tree, and it has two special properties. First, every fraction in the tree is reduced. In addition, every possible reduced fraction will appear somewhere in the tree exactly once. This second property is very appealing, it means that if we read off the tree one level at a time, the list of fractions will be a solution to our question from before. This list is called the Kalkenwolf sequence, denoted L of n. Now that we have a list, we should ask, can we compute the terms of the sequence directly? The answer is yes, and to do this, we'll need to revisit the tree. Here's the Calc and Wolf tree from before, and next to it, we'll make a new tree where the nodes are the corresponding term numbers n in the sequence. That is, 1 over 1 is first, then 1 over 2, and 2 over 1, and so on. What are the generating rules for this tree? They're simply 2n and 2n plus 1. Computer programmers may recognize these as important operations in binary, so to make the patterns in this tree more noticeable, let's rewrite the numbers in base 2. I'll denote that with n subscript 2. Now we can interpret the rules as appending a 0 to go left and a 1 to go right. That's because multiplying by 2 in binary is the bit shift operation. Bringing back the original tree, we can now use n as directions to get to L of n. I'll put start tokens outside of the trees for no n. Now we can enter the tree by appending a 1 and going right. 
we could go right again to n equals 3, then 7, and left to 14. We see that the 14th fraction in the sequence is 3 over 4, and we used 14 in binary as directions to get there. But we don't need to make the trees to do this. All we need are the rules. Let's use the same example, n equals 14. We write 14 in binary, and then we use the n tree rules to determine when to go left and right. Finally, we apply the left and right rules from the start token, first to 1 over 1, then the right rule twice more, and finally the left rule to get to 3 over 4. And this is the 14th fraction in the sequence. This process was faster, but we still had to perform the left and right rules one at a time. So let's see what multiple movements in a row look like algebraically. Here's what m right movements looks like in the tree. We begin at p over q and apply the right rule m times. This simplifies nicely to m plus p over q. On the other hand, we make m left movements by adding p to the denominator m times. This doesn't simplify right away, but the trick here is to invert the reciprocal of this fraction. Now it simplifies, and we'll do another double inversion to write this in terms of p over q. Okay, let's see what happens when we combine these two types of movements. This picture shows a generic path in the tree which leads to the fraction p over q. And here are the two rules we just determined for consecutive movements. At the bottom of the diagram, we see that p over q is m right movements away from its ancestor p prime over q prime. We can express this using our new rule, so we get this equivalence. The same thing happens in the middle with left movements, and we get another equality. We can substitute in this value and now we're two layers deep. Then we can write p over q double prime in terms of its ancestor, and so on. The result is surprisingly simple. We can write p over q as a continued fraction where the coefficients down the side are the numbers of left and right movements in the tree. Pretty cool. Let's see an example to show how much easier this is than before. We'll use 49 as n, then write 49 in binary, and this time, instead of evaluating left and right rules, we'll split the number into groups of consecutive ones and zeros. Now we just have to write these numbers as the coefficients of a continued fraction and evaluate. So the 49th fraction in the sequence is 9 sevenths. And that is not all we can do. Here are the steps we just took to get from n to l of n. The key insight here is to realize that all of these steps are reversible. So we could start with a reduced fraction like 9 sevenths, then write it as a continued fraction. I'll suggest how to do that later. Then we use the coefficients down the side to write ones and zeros, and then we treat this as a binary number and convert back to decimal. This is huge when it comes to listing algorithms, because we can answer two important types of questions. An evaluation question, like what is the 49th term in the sequence, and a lookup question, like where does 9 sevenths appear in the list? This is the power of using continued fractions to solve this problem. Now that we've covered the main result, let's see a few more things that we can do with the Calkin wolf tree. Here's the right half of the tree. You'll notice that I pruned off the left branch of 1 over 1. We should acknowledge that the construction of this tree is closely related to the Euclidean algorithm. Recall that we can write a larger number a as some multiple of a smaller number b with some remainder r. To demonstrate the connection, let's focus again on 9 sevenths at the bottom of the tree. Look what happens when we perform the algorithm on 9 and 7. Right away, we notice that the multiples, 1, 3, and 2, are the numbers of left and right movements in the tree. In addition, the values of b and r 
can be found as the numerators and denominators of the fractions at the turning points. The other thing to note is that when the algorithm stops, this number here is the greatest common divisor of the original two numbers. Here it's 1, and we should expect that, because all of the fractions in this tree are reduced. And since the Qs represent the number of movements from the star token, they are also the continued fraction coefficients of 9 sevenths. So this is one way to compute them. Now, that algorithm seemed to move up the tree, so we should investigate what it means to make backward movements and what happens when we use them ourselves. Here's the familiar picture of the left and right rules. Algebraically, we can undo these rules as follows. To make a backward right movement, we subtract q from the numerator. And to make a backward left movement, we subtract p from the denominator. The Euclidean algorithm finished at the start token, but let's see what happens when we apply these rules to go even further. Here's the Kalkenwolf tree, and if we take a backward right step from 1 over 1, we see that the start token is actually 0 over 1. But we can go further. Another backward right movement leads to minus 1 over 1. Then more backward movements produce this, and this, revealing the Kalkenwolf tree upside down and all negative. This is really nice, and it is clear now that the start token is central to paths in the tree. By reading off the rows of this new double tree, we get an extended version of the Kalkenwolf sequence with the right indexing. And this is a true solution to our question from before, since it includes all of the rationals, positive, negative, and zero. Let's see how the new terms of the sequence can be found using the binary method from before. We'll compare n equals 49 to minus 49. Originally, we wrote n in binary, and we'll do the same here, except we're going to distribute the negative to each of the place values. I'm using vertical bars to separate the place values, but this is still one binary number. Next, we group the ones and zeros, and here they are negative. You can think of them as groupings of backward movements. Then we write these numbers as the coefficients of a continued fraction, and it evaluates to 9 sevenths. The negative one should therefore be minus 9 sevenths, and so it should be the negative of this continued fraction. But there's a nice property that multiplying a continued fraction by minus 1 is equivalent to making each of the coefficients negative. By doing so, we see that the negative groupings are the negative coefficients. And that's it! Finally, let's see an example of how these results can be put to use. Recall the Fibonacci numbers, which are a list of numbers generated by the rule that the next term is the sum of the previous two terms. If we begin with a ratio of the first two Fibonacci numbers and apply the right rule, we can simplify the result using the relation. Then applying the left rule, we can do the same thing. And this will continue as we alternate left and right. In the Kalkenwolf tree, we see those Fibonacci fractions appearing here, beginning at the start token 0 over 1. The pattern to notice is that after k movements down the tree, ending with a right movement, we arrive at a ratio of Fibonacci numbers whose limit as k goes to infinity is the golden ratio. Let's apply what we know about terms in the Kalkenwolf tree. If, in the limit, we arrive at the golden ratio, then the number n is produced by alternating left and right movements. The value of n is not important. What matters is the alternation of movements, one at a time. From this, we can write L of n as this continued fraction. But L of n is the golden ratio, so these are equal. What we get is a continued fraction expression for the golden ratio. But it does take some hand-waving to make this argument. After all, it's not clear what it would mean to follow a path forever, or to find an irrational number in the sequence or that the value of n is not finite. Later in the series, we'll have a much better way to interpret this result and others like it. So that's all I have for you today, 
I hope you enjoyed, and I'll see you in the next video.